Said the night wind to the little lamb, Do you see what I see? Way up in the sky, little lamb, Do you see what I see? Good morning. Good morning, it's nearly Christmas, and so I thought I'd start with this familiar tune. It's a Christmas song, a Christmas tune. But you know, the refrain of this song, Do you see what I see? I think this refrain describes very well our message for today. This weekend is our final installment. Next slide, please. Our final installment in our sermon series, The Messianic Light in the Minor Prophets. Over the past five weeks, we've heard from the minor prophets in the Old Testament. We've seen how their prophetic words have been taken up in the New Testament, taken up in light of Jesus, the Messiah. We've heard how the prophets have been speaking to God's people, saying to them, do you see what I see? Or more precisely, do you see what God sees. The prophet Micah is no exception. Next slide, please. Uh, or prophet Micah, as uh, Madeline read for us just now. Do you see what I see? If Micah lived in our present day, he might say these things. Next slide. Do you see all these online cheats selling fake products? They uh, ship you a box of empty stuff, an empty box when you've ordered something from them. Do you see... All these scammers finding ways and means, phone calls, videos, trying to cheat people of their retirement funds, of their life savings. Do you see these cryptocurrency bros? Now some of them being charged in court. They promise great investment returns, very glitzy, very glamorous, but it was just another lie. Next slide. One of Micah's emphases is the social evils and injustices present in his community. This is Micah challenging his audience. Do you see what I see? Do you see your failure to love your own neighbor in very practical ways? Do you see that your quest for wealth, for success, for influence sometimes comes at the cost of your neighbor? Do you see your self-centeredness, your self-obsession, which results in evil and injustice? Here are some examples in Micah's own words. Next slide, Micah chapter 2. Woe to those who devise wickedness and work evil on their beds. They covet fields, they seize them, and houses and take them away. They oppress a man and his house, a man and his inheritance. Even while they sleep, they are dreaming, thinking of ways to have gain for themselves. Also in Micah chapter 6, next slide. Can I tolerate wicked scales and a bag of dishonest weights? Your wealthy are full of violence. Your inhabitants speak lies with tongues of deceit in their mouths. This theme of social evils is summed up, summed up by Micah in his Probably his one most famous verse. Shall we read this most famous verse together? On the count of three. One, two, three. Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with 10,000 rivers of oil? He has told you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God? Next slide. Many of you know this verse, right? You've seen it. Uh, you've heard it quoted in sermons. You've seen it even online. I just put some of these pictures uh, all from Google. It's a very pervasive, very common verse that you see online on social media. Last weekend, from the minor prophet Hosea. Next slide. You see the picture on the screen? That is not the prophet Hosea. <laughs> Okay, that's our a very own, very handsome, very wise Pastor Kaiming. He was preaching to us from the prophet Hosea. What does Hosea say? I desire loving kindness. I desire mercy, not merely sacrifice. It's that same word, hesed, kesed, that we see in Micah's most famous verse as well. So we see really that, that congruence, that coherence across the scriptures. Both the prophets Hosea and Micah 
they are both saying something similar. Now, they are not saying, don't worship God. They are not saying, don't bother with sacrifice. That's not what the prophets are saying. But they mean this. Next slide. Do you want to worship God? Do you really want to worship God? Yes? Good. Good. But let your worship be genuine. Your worship is proved to be genuine, not by how nicely you sing, not by how often you go to church, not by how flowery your prayers are. Micah says, do you see what I see? Your worship is proved to be genuine by your obedience of God. And your obedience for God is demonstrated in your love for your people around you, in your acts of justice, of kindness, of humility. Micah is calling out social evil and injustice. He's calling God's people, walk in God's justice, walk in God's cassette, walk in God's mercy, kindness, humility. That is genuine worship. That is one of Micah's big themes. But from Micah's big themes, let's zoom in now into our passage. Next slide. Chapter 4, verse 9 to 5, verse 5. We see a very distinct structure here. There are three sets of now referring to the present, three sets of shall referring to the future. The three sets of now, you can see this on the screen. Verses 9, 11, chapter 5, verse 1. Taken all together, Micah is speaking about war. It is a time of war. Now, I want to be careful here this morning. These days when we hear the words war and Israel in the same breath, straight away our minds think, oh, the conflict in the Middle East, in Gaza. But let's be careful here. We don't want to be so quick to read back our contemporary events into Scripture. We want to honour God's Word. This is God's Word to us and we want to honour it by honouring its original context. And so we begin with Scripture's original context and then from there, draw application to our present contemporary situation, not the other way around. So what does Scripture say? Scripture says there is a lack of leadership, verse 9. There is a gathering of enemy troops, verse 11. There is a siege of fortified, secure, supposedly secure cities. This was the reality in Micah's day. Micah prophesied in the late 700s BC. At that time, this famous kingdom, Assyria, Assyria was the enemy of all the kingdoms around it, making war, going around, conquering its neighbours. And that included the northern kingdom at that time of Israel. And later after Assyria, eventually another kingdom would come and also conquer the southern kingdom, Zion, Jerusalem they would also succumb to invasion from the kingdom of Babylon. And so when the prophet Micah said, hey, look here now, God's people, war is here. Assyria is here. He was speaking to his people at that time. Next slide. We want to honour and recognise that context in Micah. Yet as we continue to reflect on God's word, we recognise also that Micah's words Look here now, war is here. These words are actually quite timeless. This is actually a timeless message because sadly, violent conflicts are a perennial part of human history. The major wars and the conflicts, we know of them, we read in the news, we see on social media. But you know, there are so many other armed conflicts in the world that go under the radar, that go unreported. Maybe just a brief mention in the evening news. In any given year, there's likely some group of people somewhere on this planet that is suffering, suffering under the effects of armed conflict. At Christmas time, we often talk about peace, right? Uh, peace on earth, goodwill to men, sleep in heavenly peace. But in reality, the world is often not that peaceful. The world has never really been all that peaceful all the time. Now, please don't get upset with me, okay? I'm not here to uh, spoil your Christmas mood or anything, yeah? This is Christmas. But I want to remind us that the message of Christmas is this. Amidst what seems to be never-ending conflict and chaos in the world, 
God is in control. Amidst a conflict, amidst a chaos, God is in control. Some days it's really hard to believe this. The more time we spend watching the news on social media, we struggle. We struggle to affirm this. Sometimes we ask, God, where are you in all this pain and suffering that we see in the world? Sometimes all we can do is to lament before God. Pastor Joshua reminded us of that a couple of weeks ago. But amidst the chaos, amidst the conflict, God is in control. And God proves this, God shows this as he continues to speak through the prophets. Next slide. God shows that war does not have the final word because the three sets of now are accompanied by three sets of shall. This point to the future. This points to God's future plans in store. God is still control, even in the chaos. Do you see what I see? Look ahead. Look ahead to the future. See what God has in store. The first shall. God's people shall in fact go into exile and through the exile will come rescue and redemption. Now notice this. Redemption came through the exile. God didn't say that he would prevent his people from going into exile altogether. Micah didn't foretell and and escape from the tragedy of exile. Next slide. Surprise, surprise. It was in the midst of exile. It was through the very experience of exile that God worked to rescue, that God worked to redeem. Do you see what I see? The point is this, in your experience of exile, don't be afraid, don't despair, don't lose heart. For through exile, God is working to restore, God is working to rescue, God is working to redeem. This restoration, next slide, this restoration came to pass 200 years after Micah's own day. We saw this at the start of the sermon series. The prophet Haggai called the returnees, those who had returned back to the promised land, to rebuild God's temple. That is God's promise. God shows that even in our experience of exile, we don't have to lose heart because He is working to rescue and to redeem. And you know what? We are still exiles today. First Peter chapter 2. We are foreigners and exiles. This world is not our true home. Our stay on this earth is only temporary. We are foreigners and exiles. And so when we see the chaos, when we see the conflict, when we see the pain and the suffering in the world, it is right that we feel in our hearts, hey, this is not how things ought to be. It is right for us to feel that, yes, we are still living in this time of exile. But God promises us, just as he promised his people of old, if in our time of exile we follow Jesus, then this Messiah Jesus will one day lead us home. In Christ, we will see God's new creation, the new heavens and the new earth. In the Messiah, we will see God judging all evil, putting all things to to right, wiping away every tear. In Christ the Messiah, sin and death will be no more. Christ will bring us home. Next slide. We are now exiles, but one day Jesus will bring us home. In the meantime, in the meantime, in our journey of exile, we don't have to be afraid. We don't have to despair. We can take heart. Because even in exile, God is working to rescue, to redeem, to restore. So, do you see what I see? Will we lift our eyes to see God at work to redeem us even in the midst of our exile? Second, shall. God's people will arise and thresh. You shall beat in pieces many peoples. You shall devote their gain to the Lord. Now again, let's not be too quick to read into Micah's words uh, the current situation in Gaza. Uh, By the way, you all know, right, that in the Old Testament, Israel is different from the modern nation state of Israel. In our English Old Testament, the people of God uh, back then, the ancient people, they are called Israelites. 
And today, the citizens of the modern nation-state, they are called Israelis. Yeah? So there's a difference in terminology. The modern state of Israel is a secular nation-state. It comprises different ethnic and religious groups, just like our nation-state of Singapore. So give you an example. In Singapore, people of Chinese ethnicity make up about 75% of the population. Uh, yet Singaporeans also hail from many other ethnic groups. Malay, Indian, uh, others, other uh, after, uh, ethnicities. And we say, right, regardless of race, we are all Singaporean. So likewise, modern Israeli citizens, about three quarters of them, they are of Jewish ethnicity. But there are others, people of Arab ethnicity, uh, people of Central Asian ethnicity, Caucasian ethnicity, all of them are Israeli citizens too. In terms of religion, Modern Israeli citizens, uh, many of them are followers of Judaism, but they're also followers of Islam, of Christianity, of other religions. Just like in Singapore, the modern state of Israel is a multi-ethnic and multi-religious society. And so modern Israel is quite different from the Israel of old, from the Israel of the Bible. So we must be careful not to equate the two. And so this scripture text it's not saying that the modern state of Israel is going to destroy its neighboring nation states. Yeah, that's not what Micah is talking about here. But let's consider the imagery that he uses, threshing grain. Now, is threshing primarily an act of destruction? Is it primarily an act of vengeance? No, right? We know that threshing grain is not about exacting vengeance, but it's about harvesting. Threshing is to separate, to differentiate what is useful from what is useless. What is useful is the wheat, the food for nourishment. What is useless is the husk, the shaft. That's to be discarded. And so this passage is speaking about how God's people will separate the useful and the useless things of the nations. The worthless things will be discarded. But the worthy, the valuable things, they will be offered to God in worship. Our God is a God who differentiates between useful and useless, between good and evil, between right and wrong. You know, to me, this is very heartening because we live in a very a volatile, very complex world, a world with multi-layered problems, no easy solutions. Adding to this complexity is all this fake news, misinformation, disinformation uh, floating around all, all out there. We are very digitally interconnected, still yet a very polarized, a very divided, a very confused world. With all this complexity and confusion, doesn't it feel like sometimes it's, it gets a bit tough to differentiate between what is useful and what's useless? We see even in the United Nations, there's a lot less consensus, a lot more contest station. Doesn't it feel like the world sometimes needs a bit of threshing to differentiate what is right from what is wrong, what is good from what is evil? Do you see what I see? Sometimes in our day, it feels so difficult to have this differentiation. It's so hard to see what is good, what is evil. But Micah promises us, God sees. God sees. Even when complexities and confusion abound, God sees, God differentiates between right and wrong, between good and evil. I think that is very reassuring in our day. And you know, Micah, he doesn't go into specific detail here, but what he does say is that God will work through his people to thrash the nations, to differentiate just from unjust, loving from unloving, truth from falsehood. And so if you, like me, sometimes struggle with the complexities of this world, with the confusion that we see all out there, I want to say to you, take heart. Take heart for our God sees. Our God is going to thrash, He's going to differentiate truth from falsehood, right from wrong, good from evil. This is Micah's second shout. The third shout, the third future element. Well, this is Micah's second most famous verse. Next slide. It's all about Bethlehem. You know, we have so many songs about this town. 
Long time ago in Bethlehem, O come ye, O come ye to Bethlehem, O little town of Bethlehem. So many songs about this little city. And that's because of this third shower. In this third shower, we see God's messianic light shining the most clearly. This is Micah's prophetic foretelling of Jesus, Messiah. Jesus is a descendant of good King David, born in David's own hometown. And this is God's promise to his people. Amid the threat of war, of exile, amid the chaos and conflict, amid the complexity and confusion, God himself will send us a shepherd king. When we feel weak and helpless, when we feel like we are sheep without a shepherd, God himself will send the shepherd king. This king comes to rule over God's own people. He rules with mercy and kindness. He rules with great care like a shepherd. He will feed God's flock. He will bring God's people through security. This shepherd king will be one of peace. This king has been born for us at first Christmas day. A helpless, a fragile infant in a very plain and unadorned manger. And you know, through his humble life, through his sacrificial death, Jesus, the Messiah King, he demonstrates to us what it really means, as Micah says, what it really means to love justice, to walk with kindness, with mercy, to walk and live humbly before the Lord. Jesus shows us what Micah really means. And 700 years after Micah, the prophet's words remained high in people's minds. Next slide. King Herod, when he was wondering where this new king, Jesus, is meant to be born, he called together all the chief priests and scribes of the people. And King Herod inquired where the Messiah was to be born. The priests and the scribes told him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it has been written by the prophet. And then they cited the prophet Micah. Likewise, in John's Gospel, next slide, the crowd, they too knew that they too knew from Micah that God's Messiah would come from Bethlehem. But get this, there's an irony here. King Herod knew Micah's words. The crowd knew Micah's words. But they did not acknowledge Jesus' identity. Next slide. Is Jesus simply a prophet? Or is he the Messiah? Some wanted to hail him as a king. Others wanted to arrest him, get rid of him by some means whatsoever. Just who is this man? And so the crowd squabbled, the crowd bickered, and they promptly ignored Jesus' own words. Jesus said, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Did anyone say, Excuse me, Jesus, can you explain what do you mean by rivers of living, living water flowing out of my heart? Did anyone come to him and say, uh, Jesus, where can I get this living water? I want this water so I will never have to thirst again. Scripture does not record anyone in the crowd asking Jesus these important questions. They ignored his words. But back when Jesus was in Samaria, next slide, a sinful woman, a foreign woman, knew to ask these questions of Jesus. You can read a story in John Chapter 4. Do you see what I see? That so-called sinful foreign woman could see the Messiah for who he was. But this crowd, did any of them see the Messiah? By the way, this crowd wasn't just a, an ordinary ragtag bunch. This was actually a very spiritual crowd. They were there for a sacred festival. We see in verse, that, uh, verse 37, this is the Feast of Booths, the Feast of Tabernacle. And so they were faithful pilgrims. Yeah? They had to uh, use up their annual leave to travel to Jerusalem. They had to pay good money you know, uh, on, on booking.com, trip.com to book their uh, transportation, their hotels, accommodation, just to go for this crowded festival in Jerusalem. They were a devout and devoted crowd of people. They knew the ancient scriptures very well. They knew in their hearts the Old Testament, the words of the prophets. They were faithful pilgrims going to worship. 
Yet, they were so caught up in their own various opinions, they missed seeing the prophesied king himself. They missed his words. They missed responding to this king. What about us? Will we also miss responding to Jesus, our king? Jesus offers living water. In the language of that day, living water is running water, flowing water. It's the opposite of a stagnant puddle of yesterday's water. The Bible explains Jesus here is speaking of the Holy Spirit within every believer. The Spirit is like that living, running river. Dynamic, refreshing, full of life. The Holy Spirit is God himself dwelling in us, flowing in us, pouring forth, bringing forth God's life in us. Jesus offers living water. It's the life of Jesus. It's the spirit of this Messiah flowing, running in your life. Maybe you've never before told God, yes, I trust you. I believe in you, Jesus. Yes, Jesus, I would like to drink of this, your living water. Well, Jesus offers that to you today. Let's not get caught up with our various opinions, so many different views and thoughts that we end up ignoring Jesus, ignoring Jesus' offer. He offers us today living water. Will we come to Jesus? Will we come to believe, to trust in Jesus, to say yes to his living water, to his life? flowing in and through us. Or maybe you already have decided in your heart that you want to follow Jesus, you told Jesus that you trust him, but maybe your spiritual life is a bit stagnant like that puddle of water on the right side of the screen. A stale old puddle. Are you still drinking yesterday's water? Are you still taking that stale water from the last church camp? Are you still drinking the stagnant waters from the days when you were a young Christian? Come to Jesus and drink. Out of your heart will flow rivers of living water. If that's you, would you ask the Spirit once again to fill you, to flow in you once again? Would you ask the Lord to refresh your heart, to refresh your soul? Jesus himself offers this to all of us. This is God's Gracious invitation. Let's not get caught up with so many various distractions that we end up closing our eyes to Jesus. This is Jesus' offer of fresh water, flowing water, living water. Will we take up Jesus' offer this Christmas? As this message draws to a close, next slide. Let's not be like the crowd that missed out seeing Jesus. This Christmas, let's not get so caught up with activities, with parties, with gift exchanges, that we miss out seeing what God sees. Do you see what God sees? That even in the midst of chaos and of conflict, even in the midst of exile, God is still working. He's rescuing. He's redeeming. He is restoring. And so in our present time of exile, we don't have to be afraid. We can take heart in God. Do you see what God sees? That through that, that even though uh, falsehoods and fake news they swirl all around us, God separates the wheat from the chaff. God differentiates between just and unjust, right and wrong, good and evil. And so even when complexities, when confusion disorient us, we can take heart. In our God. Do you see what God sees? That Jesus is the true shepherd king, promised from of old, from of ancient days. He gives us true security. He feeds us abundantly. He waters us with his living water. So will we say yes to Jesus, Messiah? Will we say yes to his spirit filling us, flowing in us, bringing forth in us his life, his life abundantly. Said the king to the people everywhere, 
Listen to what I say, the child, the child, sleeping in the night, he will bring us goodness and light. He will bring us goodness and light. This Christmas, may we all see this precious Christ child. May we all look to this humble shepherd king. May we all respond to this saviour, this messiah, who truly brings us his goodness, his light. In the name of Christ, amen.